Tompkinsville Post Office, Company G, Camp Washington, Staten Island, November 21st, 1861. Dear Sister, I wish to inform you of my location at the present times, so that I may hear from you occasionally. I have been here about two weeks, and have written two letters and received four. I would inform you also that I am enjoying myself first rate, a plenty to eat and drink and the wherewith to keep warm. I presume that I have seen many things during the last two weeks that I would probably have never seen had I not taken the course that I have. I have been to New York twice, yes, three times over, with our company giving respectable honors to the death of one of our officers, and we had the pleasure of seeing the inside of quite a splendid church. The entrance of the church was lighted with gas in the daytime so that you can imagine that we have passed through purgatory. We had a preaching last Sabbath in camp by our chaplain. He is an Episcopalian. I believe that he reads his prayers and he is going to make the soldiers a present of a prayer book each. I received a letter from Pa and Mary last evening. Mary feels bad to think that I am going to war, but I hope with the letter that I have written I will allay her fears. I wrote to her that I belonged to an engineer regiment and we were calculated more for work than fighting, such as building forts, bridges, and cutting the way for the army. We have the promise of $19 per month. I am pretty much over the rheumatism, I guess. I like our drill exercise, first rate. If I ever get home again, I mean to have a home guard in the place where I stop. The boys are telling so many stories tonight that it is almost impossible to write. Will you excuse me this time with the promise of doing better next time? We may leave for the far south in eight or ten days. Please write as soon as you can and oblige your affectionate brother, James. This letter was among the first of many that soldier James Harvey Pollard wrote to family and friends at home in New York and Vermont during his enlistment in the American Civil War. Born in the early 1830s to parents Walter Pollard and Betsy Brigham Pollard, James was raised in the Cherry Valley along the Mohawk River of New York with brothers Charles and Edward and sisters Martha and Mary. His father worked as a stonemason and apprenticed James for two years to learn the trade of carpentry. In those days, traveling was done by stagecoach, and James moved among job sites in the area by this conveyance. It was during a stagecoach ride from Warren to Little Lakes that James made the acquaintance of Miss Lorraine Eli in 1855. A valentine adorned with cupids and lilies of the valley from 1856 bears witness to their developing relationship and read, Gladly would I this world resign if it would make thee ever mine. The couple married soon after on March 31, 1856, and were blessed by the birth of son Floyd on December 19, 1857. Within a few short years, the family of three would face separation as tensions among the states erupted into a civil war, and James felt the desire to serve his country and help quell the rebellion. While first considering an enlistment with the fighting Zouaves, James realized that he was better suited for working than fighting and was recruited in Otsego County to join the 1st New York Volunteer Engineer Regiment on October 15, 1861. Under the leadership of Colonel Edward Serrell, the regiment was known as Serrell's Engineers and James was mustered into the ranks of Company G as a private on November 6, 1861, for a service of three years. After rendezvousing in New York City, the regiment left on detachment for Port Royal, South Carolina, where it served in the 10th Corps, Department of the South. Meanwhile, Lorraine was left at home, supporting herself and young Floyd by teaching at the district school for $3.25 a week and boarding in a rented room. James kept his family and friends apprised of his situation and whereabouts through letters and sketches sent home to Lorraine and his sister Martha. Residing in Dorset, Vermont, Martha had married Reverend Parsons Pratt and he kept a journal recording James' letters before they were sent round robin among family members and friends. Eve of the 30th in South Carolina. Many may wonder what the soldier finds to do during the evenings and odd spells. Why, some of them are playing cards. Others are talking on the progress of the war. Others are taking a snooze and their minds are with the loved ones far away. Some are eating and others drinking and some have got so tight that they make considerable noise. But I spend most of my odd spells in my tent and a good many of them alone. 
I want to improve myself in something, so that when I come home again, if God should spare my life, that my friends and relatives will not say that I have lost the three years entirely. I am a soldier in arms in the cause of my country, but there are many moments that a soldier experiences that will either tend to make him better or worse. I don't think that playing cards will aid in the happiness of the future, either in this world or the next, and the drinking of liquor is another wearing away of both body and mind, and unfitting the partaker for decent company after the war, whether dead or alive. Therefore, I shun these evils, and by the help of God I mean to be able to copy the features that he has delineated in the face of man. I think the pastime is harmless, and I am sure that it has no degrading influence, but rather an elevating tendency. And if I live and can accomplish what I intend to at the expiration of my time, I shall not consider my odd moments as lost, but I think I can apply them to advantage for the support of myself and family. And I think of things that might befall me. I may be crippled before I leave this army, and my chances for having left on my body a right arm is another inducement for me to try and make myself skillful while I indulge the taste that God himself has put within me. This I have written for a pastime, and still is my mind as whimsical as some might deem it. And whatever may be my fate, this may fall into the eye of some interested one, and it would tell from the tomb what the heart would speak. Through his letters, James conveyed his hopes and fears to his loved ones while providing a slice-of-life look at his experiences in the army. Possessing a talent and penchant for drawing, he put pencil to paper to capture the scenes at his encampments and points of interest as his regiment took part in various military engagements in the South. From hurried pencil sketches to detailed pen and ink drawings, James made illustrations throughout his enlistment to depict his situation and surroundings for his family, to practice and hone his skills for use in life after the war, and to preserve his memories of the historic scenes that were unfolding. Folly Island, August 13, 1863. Dear friends of Vermont, Strange as you may think it, the brothers Charlie and James are writing under the same tent cloth and the joy that we feel we pledge ourselves to acknowledge on the same sheet. Charlie landed on this island August 3rd, but I was not aware that his regiment was so near us until night before last. He fell out of ranks as he was passing our camp on Morris Island on his way to the trenches as picket. He easily found me, and as he could not get excused from the duty for the night, I went up to the front with him and for the first time experienced what the common soldier has to endure in the trenches under fire and there in those trenches we lay and talked over our family matters while the rebels shot and shells were making all sorts of noises about us. And they would often make us forget what we were speaking of last, so close was the bursting of some shell or the humming of its fragments. But we were pretty safely covered and we looked at it as a splendid execution of fireworks. By the way, I am still in the quartermaster's department and the way that I am favored over the common run of soldiers makes me feel very thankful. For if I was in an infantry regiment or dung duty in my own company, I would never have been permitted to come over here and make Charlie a visit. But my quartermaster likes me, and he gets me all I wanted without any trouble to him or me. Charlie's camp is located about five miles from ours, and there is a ferry between. He, like myself, is strong and healthy, which we attribute to the temperate habits of our ancestors and the inclination they have given us to follow in their footsteps. The state of affairs in this vicinity we cannot answer at present in full, but when all is over, we will tell you all. I hope we can tell you how we fell the strongholds of rebellion. I close to commence one to Mary. My love to you all, your affectionate brother, James. From Charlie to the dear friends in Dorset Parsonage, how happy I am today, strange and as it seems unthought of almost, as it has been to me. James and I have met in this far southern state in perfect health and fine spirits. This meeting is so pleasant and so unexpected to us both that we hardly know how to express our joy. He is to spend the night with me, and we have decided to write to all the relatives and let them know what a pleasant thing has occurred to us. I wrote you some time ago giving description of our expedition on the peninsula, and now I might cover a whole sheet telling of our pleasant voyage to this isle. Don't you think I am getting to be considerable of a traveler? Well, it is just what suits me. I take great interest in visiting these places, which are to be historic in years to come. I am glad to find James so favorably situated. I hope he will continue to escape a great deal of drudgery that soldiers doing duty in companies have to perform. Write soon to your ever affectionate Charlie. 
Monday morn, September 21st, 1863. Here, Lorraine, I have given you something of an idea of the bomb-proof of Wagner. The work is one calculated to stand a long siege if rightly conducted, but if dead bodies are allowed to lie carelessly about, they will get stuck out in spite of their mighty earthwork and massive timbers which support the whole. I also give a rough plan showing you the dark alleys that must be where there is such a covering. There all about this was a ditch with water in it, and its bed or bottom was covered with plank with sharp spikes in. I don't know as you will understand my drawing, but you doubly have seen it better explained in some of our pictorials. My sketches are generally made in haste, as I cannot tell what moment I shall be called by the quartermaster. Therefore, I hope you will not form an idea that I have done the best I could, had I had time. I don't know as those interest you, but there is a young idea generally looking over your shoulder I wish to impress, and by these simple lines there may take root the foundation that composes a genuine artist. What does he seem to like or take a notion to about everything else? Does he like to drive horses and dig potatoes and make hay and all such? Well, every boy does. But I used to think that he could mark the figure Napoleon pretty promptly for so young a shooter. Please inform me if that interest still exists. 8 a.m. I will write more at noon. Noon of the 21st. It seems to be a false report about the Arago being in. Perhaps I had better mail this and await it coming. We are not paid yet, but probably will be before long. There is a rumor that a part of our regiment are going to leave here soon so you need not be surprised if I hail from some other quarter sometime. This is one entrance to Wagner. This will show you how the timbers were put in to support the mass of dirt. The place is about big enough for a horse and wagon to drive in. You can also see the enclosure out of the bomb proof. Below is a lookout, another entrance, up a flight of stairs and there's another cannon, the telegraphs, which tells at this end when anyone is wounded or killed of anything also. Still dear Lorraine, Another Sabbath Eve finds me thinking what they may be doing miles and miles away. I imagine you are enjoying yourself, talking with God, or singing to him who doth all things well. There has been more singing during the evenings here than I have ever heard before since I have been in the army. Tis not only the colored persons here, as it was at the head, but as I listen I can hear assemblies far and near blending their voices in those good old tunes that I have heard from my childhood. But they seem to affect me more here as they bring faces to my recollection that may have slumbered for years waiting for that familiar strain. By the way, there has been some good singing in the next tent this eve, and each tune seemed to have its history in connection with some voices that had made an impression when boyhood fancies marked a spell, but little thinking at the time that they would ever be called up in days like these, and be the source of so much pleasure to me. Lorraine, perhaps you think I have plenty of company here, and need have no occasion to wish for any greater variety to make time pass smoothly by. If you could have taken a close bird's eye view in our camp this eve, just before I concluded what I would do, you would have seen me away, alone, and I was trying to decide whether to loiter about the camp and get the report circulating as what, and I finally decided to come to my tent and read a chapter in the Testament, and I decided that I would open the book at random and perhaps I might read the same chapter that you were reading. I opened at the fourth chapter of John, where Jesus met the woman of Samaria at the well and told her all she ever done. So she reported at the place where she lived, and Mary went to see him, and Mary believed. But whether she told the five husbands or not, it did not say. But I think if she did, that there was some cause for jealousy, and likely somebody killed. Most always is. But you want to tell me now, don't make light of the Bible. Lorraine, I don't mean to. I consider it sacred. But still, I cannot help but think of the condition of such parties at this age. If there is hurt in the thought, I can't help it. And I thought you would perhaps give me some information. Tis after roll call, and I must turn in, as the sailors say. I hope to hear from you again. Your last was mailed the 7th, written before breakfast at your uncle's. I hope you will soon get settled in your new home, for I long for some of those long letters that you have already promised me. I visited Battery Wagner on the 15th. I made a few sketches from its bomb proof, also the proof itself, exterior, but the shells were flying and I could not get many. I also took one of Fort Sumter from Battery Gregg, and here you can see something of the appearance after the monitors had made their trials on our walls, but a rebel rag still flies over our corner as you can see. But when General Gilmore gets ready to put ours in its place, I trust it will be accomplished and scientifically, as he has taken Wagner and Gregg with little loss of life. Floyd might ask the question, where did Pa stand when he took Sumter? Tell him that I was standing by a gun in Battery Gregg where I had a fine view of the whole harbor, but the shells bursting overhead made me nervous, and my hand trembled so that I gave up any further illustrations, trusting you have seen it all long before this in some of the pictorials. 
They shelled our men, but fortunately but few are killed or wounded. We have men at work on Black Island that suffer from the shells the most. I saw Charlie on the 15th. He stopped on his way to Wagner as picket. His health is good yet. The weather is quite cool now, especially at night and in the morning till the sun gets up some way. I suffered from cold so much last night with one blanket and overcoat that today I drew another blanket which has set down three dollars against my clothes bill. I have drawn about eighteen dollars worth from about forty dollars that we are allowed annually. I will close hoping to get a letter from you in the morning. Good night. Yours in affection. Your hussy, James. A pudding for dinner but no letter yet. There is a rumor afloat that Fremont is working to have the first volunteers discharged in January next so as to enlist again and receive the benefit of the bounties. I think it would be giving us fair play, don't you? You would let me come out again if some drafted fellow would plunk me down five hundred or a thousand dollars, wouldn't you? That would set you all right, and you could spend more time writing letters and not work yourself to death. I am sorry that you have to work so to get along, but keep up good courage. War will be over sometime, I hope, and then, if we live through it all, we will love each day more, perhaps. Is that so? I say yes, Lorraine. Folly Island, January 26th, 1864. Page 1. Cherished Ones. I have managed to get a candle this eve, and I thought it would be almost religiously consumed if I allowed a portion of it to light a few thoughts over this barren sheet which is patiently waiting to bear a soldier's humble message. If this doom sheet could speak, don't you suppose it would complain and say, Why could I not have some general's thoughts instead of this poor engineer's? Then it might attempt to persuade me to press forward and obtain those laurels, but all the while thinking that perhaps fortune might turn its own smoky and tattered form to account, and when buried, as it might be neath for years to come, fortune might turn it up some day to sparkle as a gem in a noonday sun. Such is life. We are all hoping some day to gain some higher point, if not for this world's honor and glory. He looks for a higher seat in heaven. Page 4. Tis not to love whiskey or tobacco, nor learn to swear, but we see human nature acted out here, and one would be a fool that could not take some lessons for his benefit. In 1861 we could find true patriots in our rank, but you will find them now as eager, after an extra hundred dollars, as anyone. As long as our beloved Uncle Sam has a sound bottom, but when she begins to leak, then look out. It will be like jumping overboard to drown in clear water. My last letter from my wife contained a photograph of my little boy. It was good. I hope my wife has already sent you one. If not, write to her and tell her to fork over. I think a great deal of mine. I wish sometimes that he was old enough to be a drummer boy. I would have him along, and I think that if I got him, I could get my wife to come too. I wish he had the engine or the style to enlist, assume a name, and someone to be sworn in and pass examination, and she filled the place under an assumed name. If I could have such a tent mate, I would not be so scrupulous about an extra hundred dollars. But I must close, for M&M &M has just come and told me to get ready immediately. Pack up. Hurrah for Hilton Head. Goodbye. Write often. Love to the girls in due time. Many thanks to you, Martha and Brother Parsons, for your kindness towards me thus far. Goodbye from your beloved James, brother and uncle. James was honorably discharged from Company G on January 31, 1864, and re-enlisted the next day as an artificer for Company H of the 1st New York Volunteer Engineer Regiment. His company served with the Army of the James and took part in operations in Virginia at Dutch Gap, Bermuda Hundred, Petersburg, and Richmond, and made an expedition to Barber's Plantation in Florida. During this time, James continued to keep in touch with family and friends and added to the collection of his illustrations that he would one day carry home in a leather portfolio that he had found leaning against a tree as he was coming off the field. Jacksonville, Florida, February 23, 1864. Cherished Ones, as I have nearly recovered from the hard march after the battle, I think how anxious you might feel about me, and I resolve to write a few lines to each of my correspondents, if no more to let them know that I am not yet numbered among the many killed, wounded, or missing that you have probably read of in the report of battle beyond Sanders Station. But I have been where the balls whizzed by us, but fortunately, for the thirty that were there of our company, none were damaged by the dance at Finnegan's Ball. Engineers are not supposed to be in front, but I was near as I wanted to be. By this you understand that I have returned to my company. There was not much work for me to do in the quartermaster's department, 
and I was needed in the company, so on the 13th, I got orders to shoulder my knapsack and go with my company. The first day we went 20 to a place called Baldwin, a railroad station house, a few buildings, a tavern of course, but no church. We pitched our tents and rested a day or two, and then 30 of our company got orders to go on about 12 miles farther to a place called Barber's Plantation, or Ford, located on a branch of St. Mary's River. There we fortified until the 20th, and then a general order to push our way to Lake City. There we would probably went but a few miles. This side, the Rebs had thrown up preparations to give us battle, and they did, and our brave soldiers were obliged to fall back. The engineers came back to Barber's, and we arrived about one in the morning, tired enough to lie down. We were around at daybreak to go to Baldwin. We arrived there about 2 p.m., pitched our tents, and in about two hours we got orders to take everything that we could carry conveniently with the probability that everything would be burnt that was left, for the officers got wind that Reb was trying to get into Jacksonville ahead of us by another road. But we hear since that our things are all safe and Baldwin is still in our possession, and the report is that the five brass pieces that the Rebs took from us have been retaken. Three cheers for our brave men. We may come out best after all, though many of our brave have kissed the dust and many more wounded and some taken prisoners. The exact amount lost will probably be from a thousand to fifteen hundred. It was awful to see the fellers go in full of pluck and be shot down in such numbers, all done in about two hours. Only thirty of our engineers were there, and we were placed across the road to stop all that were not wounded from skedaddling. It was heartrending to send a man back after he'd been in the thickest of it, but we only stopped them so as to prevent a panic. But I saw the officers draw their sword and tell men to return to their company right under the rest of the fire. Oh, it is horrible, but such is war. We are now putting up at a large brick store in Jacksonville, and I am writing where the bookkeeper used to keep the books. We have the up and down of life, if anyone. We are now on the top shelf. But many are doomed to the loss of some loved one, and to prove it more true, I brought a portfolio from the field, and in it was a song, When This Cruel War Is Over. Weeping sad and lonely, hope and fears how vain, yet praying when this cruel war is over, praying that we meet again. I did not take this from my knapsack, but it lay beside a tree and I snatched it up when we were coming off. Yours in affection, James. I hope I shall get a furlough after this expedition. Love to the little ones. Keep good cheer till I can. Encamped up James River, landing call Bermuda 100, two mile above City Point, in charge of pontoon train, May 15, 1864. Dear friends, in order to fulfill my promise in respect to the time that I should write you, I feel bound to keep my promise good, in mind that I do not consider it much of a task either to write to my friends. I know that my reward should not be much, to love them where love is so bountifully reciprocated. Reward or not, this is perfectly natural to love those that love you, and be kind to those who are ever looking to our welfare. Not but what we should fulfill the scripture and love our enemies too. This I try to do. I pity the poor fellows as we see them daily taking over our docks and going aboard steamers for Fortress Monroe. Can I love them as I would a sister or brother? Often they have tried to kill me. I can pray, God forgive them, for they know not what they do. But many of them are relieved by being taken prisoners, and where they would starve us in the gloomy prisons situated the same, we kill the fatted calf and invite them in. The war is going on gloriously. Triumph after triumph makes us feel that there is hope in some day closing up this cruel war. May 17th. Tis about 8 o'clock. I am lying in my tent expecting every moment the bugle will sound to go on detail. Our division at the front got repulsed yesterday. The enemy sprang upon us in the fog and in such numbers as to compel us to fall back. You will probably get full details of the battle before you get this. We took some prisoners, however, as well as they. I am still in good health. I wish you all well. Martha, I am unable to get any flea powder here for your bird. I was on guard Sunday and yesterday. I was at liberty to do as I choose, and I wrote a letter to my wife and drew some. Our company are taking up and putting down pontoons. I expect we will run one across the river today to let about 40,000 cavalry across this side. It makes me feel sad some to think that our men suffered so yesterday. We were having such good luck that I was in hopes the God of battles was going to have a sudden closing of the war. But all for the best, I hope. I hope I shall get some letters soon from you to help cheer one. I have received one from you and one from Lorraine, written May 2nd, directed to Bowery Street. Remember, Company H, New York 1st Volunteer Engineers, 10th Army Corps, Fortress Monroe. 
Much love to the little ones. I hope I shall live to see you all again when this cruel war is over. Soldier's Home, number 50 and 52 Howard Street, May 30th, 1864. Brother, sister, and all, I thought I would just drop a line in some lamp posts, trusting that you would soon hear of our leaving the city of New York for Richmond, Virginia. You have expressed so much interest in my welfare that I shall endeavor to keep you posted respecting my whereabouts all through the coming campaign, unless something should befall me. We leave the city for Fortress Monroe tomorrow at 7 a.m., we are told, and from there we are bound for Yorktown. General Gilmore is relieved at Hilton Head, and he will probably be with us as usual, but in another department. I shall feel we are marching onward to glory, and that your hearts are with us. And often I shall hear you wishing that James could share a custard pie with you, as I partake of our plain fare. Now all of you will think of me, and I shall feel it, and it will be a source of much pleasure. Tell little Berta that she is not overlooked in my thoughts and conversation. I feel that the little innocents hold close communion with God, and for that reason I consider their prayers beyond price. I shall endeavor to do right by abstaining from evil, and whatever my destiny shall be, I hope to be prepared to meet it. While I have been in the city, many temptations have allured my path. But I have prayed to God to help me where I am weak, and I think he has heard me. He knows that we are all prone to sin, but when we will ask for help in the hour of trial, his arm is ever ready to rescue or to save. I will close with much love to you all. Yours in affection, James. This soldier's home is a grand institution and well conducted, I think. Bermuda Hundred, Virginia, Sunday, June 5th, 1864. Dear friends, I find that my last visit to Vermont was one that has paid for itself in different ways. I notice in particular how much more fluently Anne's pen glides over the various occurrences of the day, giving here and there a touch in her composition that lends beauty and case to its tone, and at the same time bringing in the various subjects that would interest the reader. If you were only here, we might find it pleasant to visit the woods again, which are beautiful now. I hope that day may come, Anna, when I can hear those merry voices again, when I can join with them in their shrill melody. I would sooner join in a snowball even with you than play a game of ball that they are now playing here or within a few miles of us at present times. And now that you have wished me there, would it be improper for me to wish you here to witness the pleasure part of army life, to view the scenes of Virginia and take sketches of June nature? And then at night, when I was on guard a few nights ago over our pontoon bridge, I could hear the owl hoot and the whippoorwill, and now and then something would splash in the water as big as a man, perhaps. This would almost make one's hair stand in a country loaded with bloodthirsty cesses. I suppose the noise in the water was caused by innocent alligators, but one does not think of innocence at first way out on a bridge with only one other person with me. The first thought would be to cock my gun, expecting next moment a dozen rebels would be hurrying us off to some rebel prison. Night before last, there was heavy and fast firing in the direction of Richmond. It was probably 12 or 14 miles off, and perhaps in Grant's army. This was just after sundown, and since that, we have not heard but little cannoning. Grant is now getting pretty close to the ill-fated city, and we expect to hear every day that he has made the final end of Jeff Davis, and turned the old folks all out of doors, and took the hired girls prisoners. Well, you know what I mean. Make a general overhauling of this whole domain. Storm the prison doors all in, and to the great joy of the universe, let the sun smile in upon the inmates once more. Charlie left this point, I understand, and went to the White House up York River. I have not seen him, but I saw a fellow from his regiment a few days ago. I sent him word that I was well, and if he got time to drop me a note. Anna, you requested to know if I was seasick. The sea was very calm coming down, and I was not sick at all. You know that I wanted to come to Virginia. I feel quite near home when I can get a letter only three days old. We have not been exposed to any danger yet. I feel as safe here almost as I would in Vermont. We are situated in a bend of the river so that if rebels undertook to come down on us, they would be likely to be taken all prisoners. Yours for the present, James. Bermuda 100, Virginia, June 14, 1864. Sweet Carrie. I received yours dated the ninth. I guess nearly a week since, and now is the time agreed upon for me to reply, the 15th, is close at hand, and fearing that I shall be busy tomorrow laying pontoon up the Appomattox, I will avail myself of my present leisure. Carrie, it makes me feel proud to know that I have in my possession a sample of your handwriting and composition, and I hope if this war continues, it will not be the only specimen that I can claim from you in the shape of respect to your soldier uncle. You must feel that your influence is necessary towards putting down the rebellion, 
and you will therefore deal it out liberally, and of course you will expect to share in the honors, if not the horrors, of war. This you will have, my little pet. God will notice and reward you, if no one else, for every word of kindness, courage, or cheer, that you may cast around one so little deserving as myself. It is through the influence of your sex that war exists, I argue, and the parties that are best supported by some will likely prevail. I had a letter from Charlie about ten days ago, in one instance he mentions that came under his notice since he left Bermuda, of a rebel orderly which was numbered among our prisoners, somewhere between here and the White House or the York River. He writes that she created quite a sensation. In one remark of hers I will mention, you can translate it as you think proper, says she, you dumb Yankees tried to flank my battery, but you could not come in. I have just got sit down, and we must fall in again. Good night. Sunday, the 19th. Have been at work all day, and I expect to have to work tonight. I saw a little fellow today going home. Monday, June 20th. Carrie, I don't know what you will think of my letter, but I will tell you. The day that I commenced your letter, I was obliged to put away my writing and prepare for a march. Our pontoon bridge had to be loaded onto a barge, and where we were going with it but few of us knew. It was nearly noon on Wednesday, I think, when we started down the river towed by the little tug Ellie Carl. I lay down and slept going down, for our detail had been at work all night and without rest. So you see, we must, when we would ride out for pleasure with Uncle Sam, improve the rare opportunity for a double purpose. Just before leaving the landing at Bermuda, I received a letter from Father, the first I have had from him since leaving home. All seemed to be kicking yet, and a natural desire to hear from his boys, though I guess that Charlie is pretty punctual about writing him. By the way, I would mention that Charlie came here and inquired for me a short time after I had left with the pontoon so that I was deprived of the pleasure of meeting him. But he left word with a fellow that he was well and had stood the rough march to the White House. Well, I tell you, Charlie's regiment sees some rough times. I saw a little fellow yesterday that told me he was going home and somehow I made the inquiry of where he lives and he told me West Dorset, Vermont. His name is Herman Shepherd, and he is going to see an uncle by the name of Clyde. He told me that he knew you and will call and see you. He started at Eve yesterday and will probably be in Vermont in four or five days. He can give you some particulars respecting war life, though he is not enlisted. I am very thankful that I was permitted to bid one goodbye that would probably see those I love very soon. We got papers yesterday of the 18th and that Petersburg was ours, but that's disputed by those who have been near it. We are situated so that we can burn it whenever we choose. I have been wanting to get some time to draw you some little pictures that might interest you. I have not any copies for your inspection yet. I wish you well, all of you. Remember Berta that took on so when I was leaving? Has she a word or kiss for Uncle Jim? Carrie, remember me and write often. Please send your type, will you? From Jim. Bermuda Hunter, Virginia. July 11, 1864. My dear niece, I received yours written on the 7th. I am glad that you are mindful of me, even when you are enjoying the visits of near and dear friends. Carrie, I am very busy nowadays. Somehow my little taste for copying nature will yet be a big thing for me. I am in possession of a pass at this moment to take me on forbidden ground by command of General Butler. This is all for a bit of pleasure, you might say, for there is nothing that I can yet call work about it. I am only waiting for my dinner, and then I take the boat and go across the river to a plantation, and I am to take a general view of this side, called Bermuda Landing. I am at work for the Provost Marshal Colonel Fuller. Is this Fuller any relation to that one in Dorset? The Colonel told me that he would see I was detached for his orders so that I could devote the whole time to drawing. Carrie, you see, I am in some haste. I cannot think of much to write now, but as I was waiting for my little boat, I thought I would answer you and send you a sketch of this landing, taken from this side, about a half mile above. I wish I could explain it to you. The first building is our post office at the right, and I put in the Christian Commission tents, which comes a little further back by sights, but I know you are interested in all good things as this, so I put it at the extreme right. Where you see the big flag is the Provost Marshal's, where I am at work still. I board with my company still, but I may be detached altogether, which I hope. Our captain does not like to have me leave, and if his influence is respected, I may have to continue as I am, only at work for him. I have not heard from Charlie of late, that is for three or four days. I think I should get a pass to go to Petersburg soon, and there I will see him. This sketch business will take me most anywhere. In this yard, front of the provost, are tents, 
and across the way are settlers, both in tents and buildings. At the left in the distance is City Point, a little flag you will see. Our mailboat is the square flag. Christian Commission at the right and rear of the post office flag. The barge at the dock is loaded with provisions and other stuff. The next is a passenger boat, and the next a little tugboat. Dinner is ready, and I must go eat and be off. You will excuse my nervous letter, Carrie girl. My love to those where you know it will be agreeable. We had a blueberry pudding on the 4th. I enjoy myself pretty well, and all I want to make happiness complete is a woman. Excuse all faults while I remain your very affectionate Uncle Jim. Branch Depot, in the field near Butler's headquarters, October 16th. Dear Endeavor, and I wish you could be where I could see you this morning. This is a splendid Sabbath morn, and on the opposite leaf you can see something as the land lies about us, and though tis not as well as I can do if I try. Still I don't know as you care for that, but I must say that you have tried to have me improve, as you offered to send me copies and Bristol board to draw upon. But Lorraine, I will do as well as I can while in the army, and I think with a little instruction after the war is over, I shall be all right to paint window curtains or anything else that may come in my way, but don't take this for a sample. I still think that I shall get me a commerce and go into the business on a wholesale, if thee does not there oppose me very much. You think that Jordanville will not be a suitable place for me? If you still think so and have an opportunity to make a sale and pocket the cash, you would better do so, for this war will not last long, and then I would like to make arrangements for whatever we may conclude to do. I believe that one can get a lot in some place cheap, and then we can put up a comfortable and tasty small habitation and be better suited for all purposes. If we put up a building, I shall do considerable of the work. I shall not be so afraid of work as I would if I never had worked. I must close this as the opportunity to send is going down. The cook is going, and is going to leave me in charge of cooking till he comes back. I do not have to work but very little, but only be on hand. Just suits me exactly. Much love to you all. Goodbye, my loving boy. Yours till death, James H. Pollard, Engineer Depot, Bermuda 100, Virginia. October 17th. I did not get this off yesterday, but I must this time. I am well contented as a soldier could be. Right often is convenient. We don't get paid yet. We keep a cow hidden in a bush. We have new milk every night and morn. The officers would take it for their own if they knew it. James received a second honorable discharge as his regiment was mustered out on June 30th, 1865. Leaving from Richmond, Virginia, James returned home to his family in New York. Following the war, James, Lorraine, and Floyd moved westward across the state and settled in Niagara County. James took up his trade of carpentry again and built houses around the Middleport and Gasport area while continuing to use his artistic talents. Gasport, December 8, 1878. Dear Sister, I was down to Mary's on Tuesday last and stopped there two or three days. During my stay there, she read me your letter which remembered me. It brought to mind that I must write to you. Mary's people are all well, and so are we, or mine. There are no great changes with us, only what are made by the fingers of time. We all look older, which change you will find everywhere you go. You write in Mary's letter that plants and babies are your greatest pleasure, and I would say that mine lies in art mostly in copying nature, and it is my greatest regret that I am not a skillful artist instead of an ordinary house builder. My odd moment at the present age of 46 years is spent drawing. I use mostly charcoal drawing, as I never have taken lessons in paint in any shape, but I admire painting and statuary. I think if I could be set back 15 or 20 years and knew I could live them over, I would surprise you. I wanted to attend the centennial, but I could not make myself believe I could afford it, so I must wait until the next. But I am satisfied now, at any time I could see enough if I could travel. But if I could spend my whole time now in copying faces and scenery at home, a feast I would have most bountiful. When you wrote, you made mention of a charcoal drawing of you and Father Pratt. That is the style of drawing I am doing mostly. I am satisfied that if a person will sit properly, I can get his or her expression and can put it in shade quite well, but not as well as I intend to if I live and my eyes keep good. We, you understand, are a gasport. We are not rich retired farmers, but we let out our farm. We have sold our farming utensils and are beginning to use economy in the way of living comfortable and happy. We find it an improvement on the old method of plenty of hard work and little pay. Much love to all. Let me hear from you soon. James H. Pollard. 
In 1882, James and Floyd faced tragedy as Lorraine, beloved wife and mother, died and was laid to rest in Gasport. As time and grief passed, James learned through relatives of a woman who had been abandoned by her husband and stranded in Erie, Illinois with her two children. The pair gained acquaintance through correspondence, and when James had his affairs in order, he traveled to Illinois to meet her in person and court her properly. In 1884, Mary Mosier Ledoux became Mrs. James Pollard, and the couple welcomed daughter Martha Eleanor into their lives in 1885. The family returned to New York and took up residence in the new home that James had built on Vernon Street in Middleport before his two-year trip to Illinois. In April 1904, James sensed that his time had come and told daughter Martha, I think I'm going to die today, but I will meet death like a soldier. As James grew deathly ill, Martha was approached by members of the Village Board of Education who offered her a teaching position at $320 for the following year. Death came to meet James that day just as he had predicted and he was laid to rest in Heartland Cemetery. Martha took the teaching position and went on to marry and have a family of her own. With husband Robert at her side, she continued to teach for nearly 50 years and raised four children. She kept her father's memory alive and recounted stories of his life and experiences in the Civil War to sons Robert, Alan, and Harvey, and daughter Marjorie. To Marjorie, she passed on the many letters, drawings, and mementos that had been saved from those long ago days, and now they have become treasured family heirlooms and a testament to one man's journey through a nation's historic struggle to define itself. How prophetic it turned out to be that soldier and artist James Pollard had written on the back of one of his drawings from the war. The day may come when this would be irrelevant.